I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Okay. I'd like to uh, say a few words about that meditation and, and the why of it. Uh, as you probably know, um, the Buddha pointed out in his first noble truth that uh, all human experience, certainly, uh, probably that of many other non-human creatures, has three characteristics. First, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes there are unpleasant experiences. We all face um, certain things, including aging, illness, and death, the loss of others we love, one way or another. Uh, he also pointed out that the second characteristic of all human experience is that even the most pleasant experiences end or change. They may be replaced by another pleasant experience, but there's a changingness in them, an endingness about them. And he also pointed out that experiences, as experiences, the hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, imagining, wanting, loving, hating, all experiences um, are insubstantial, connected to each other, empty of absolute identity or solidity, and thus incapable of being possessed, and therefore incapable uh, of providing uh, lasting happiness. Any, any single experience is incapable of that. The Buddha pointed that out. But then he pointed out that what turns that into suffering is when we add craving to it. When we get pressured, driven, insistent, possessive, selfish, self-referential, my precious, right? And so if craving is the root of suffering, how can, what is the root of craving? And by understanding the root of craving, how can we bring craving to an end? And biologically, the fundamental root of craving is a sense of deficit or disturbance. Something is missing, something is wrong. Whether it's a lizard darting about in my backyard, squirrels bickering with each other <laughs> over who's got the nut, uh, or you know humans uh, struggling with each other. When we feel like something is missing or wrong, naturally the body and mind move into a state of craving and then suffering begins. So the art is to abide in this world with its inherent characteristics and challenges and opportunities with less and less craving. How do we do that? If craving is based on a sense of something missing or wrong, that's in reference to things we need. What do we need? We need to be safe, we need to be satisfied in various ways, and we need to be connected. Those are the three classic needs you see throughout biology. People talk about need frameworks in different ways. These three are, are very fundamental. Argu arguably, they're needs that don't fit into that framework, but most, most of our needs do. So when we don't feel safe enough, we feel scared, we feel angry, we feel frozen, forms a craving. When we don't feel satisfied enough, we feel disappointed, frustrated, um, dis dispossessed, law, like we've had losses, we get addicted. And when we don't feel connected enough, we feel lonely, we feel inadequate, we feel ashamed, we feel envious, we feel vengeful, cruel, hateful toward others. So if we can meditate and deepen our sense of feeling safe enough and satisfied enough and connected enough in the present, in the present at least, there's almost no fuel for craving. So marinating in a sense of warm-heartedness, contentment, and peacefulness 
is a way, at least during the meditation, for remo removing, removing the fuel for the fires of craving in a very embodied and fundamental way. And to do that practice again and again, as I've been doing for quite some time now, and teaching, um, really helps to move states of fullness and balance rather than something missing, something wrong. States of lovingness, contentment, and peace that are authentic, those increasingly become traits from state to trait. And more and more you're rested in a sense of enoughness already. Yeah, the side of enlightenment, speaking personally, you can still get rattled, but you tend to recover more and more quickly as you deepen the neurological layers, layer after layer after layer, and, and throughout your whole body, actually, of feeling that there's a fundamental resilience and well-being in your core. If Even if around the edges, it can get fairly frazzled. It's a very powerful meditation. It's kind of a homecoming. Safe enough, satisfied enough, connected enough, peaceful, content, and rested in love. That's the, the method behind that. I should add just briefly about a question that came in about contentment. Con feeling content is one of the most underrated states of being, especially in our Western culture in which a book gets written about dopamine, the molecule of more, more. Stay thirsty, my friends, you know. And so uh, obviously if we don't have enough, it's hard to feel content. On the other hand, think about people who've taken vows of poverty. They live on a meal a day. They don't know what will land in their bowl. If nothing lands in their bowl, they go hungry, and yet deep in their heart, they feel content. So um, it's possible to find a sense of feeling content in the present, aided, it's true, certainly by an awareness of gratitude and thankfulness, your friends, your friend gratitude, your friend, thankfulness. Good friends to have. Um, and also even a sense of just the arisingness of everything continuously. It's like an overwhelming giving or gaining that we're continually receiving even as the moment changes. The arisingness of everything. Whoa. You can help yourself to feel content. And as you find that experience of feeling content, at least in a moment, maybe try it after when it's easy, like after a big meal, if you can have access to a good meal and or like a good day, you know, know what it feel what it like, what it's like to feel content. And then help yourself increasingly come home to that experience. Really, it's funny. Um, so I've, you know, started meditating in 1974 and was exposed to human potential stuff certainly by 1969. And, um, you know, when I look at those three areas, uh, lovingness, peacefulness, and contentment, the one that's been the most challenging for me is contentment. You know, lovingness is straightforward, you know, it's pretty accessible, peacefulness, confined. Wow, content, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> the habit of drivenness and goal-directedness and chasing the next accomplishment, it's pretty deep. So content, that's something to really take a look at if you like. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about fear. And um, obviously we live in times that um, in which there are many threats. And we've, as a species, uh, come through a time of great plague well over a million people in America died due to the plague of COVID over just the last few years. Uh, there are threats that we are aware of, <clears throat> climate catastrophe, you know, 100 million tons a day of CO2 are excreted into the sky through human activity, 100 million tons a day. Uh, and then war, wars. So many 
wars, armed conflicts. Some make the headlines, some just quietly, not quietly for those who have to endure them, but as far as the rest of the world is concerned, they don't make the headlines, you know, in Africa, um, Myanmar, uh, certainly Ukraine, and now, and, and for a long time, surging forward most immediately in the Middle East. We're aware of these things, right? We're aware economically of, you know, difficulties in finding a job, even ironically or strangely in America with full employment, uh, you know, challenges if we want to, to be able to get a house, but we can't. Interest rates, we don't know when that'll be possible. You know, certainly first world problems, but real issues for people. These are real things. Concerns about where your country is headed. Uh, as, you know, simple fairness and decency just seems to be gleefully upended. So there's stuff to be scared of. How do we practice with this? So try to stay away from offering op-eds in the chat sidebar. Stay focusing, stay focused on your own personal practice. Um, just how it's landing for you, what your experience is and how you practice with what you're experiencing. Fear is Along with disgust, I think probably, arguably, uh, one of the earliest emotions to evolve in the evolving nervous system over its 600 million year progression to this point today in us. Um, and that's because first and foremost in the wild, you know, a creature needs to find lunch today, not become lunch today. Uh, I recently saw this little thing in the New York Times, some of these little science tidbits that referred to this very small wasp, which will sting a much larger for it cockroach, paralyze the cockroach, drag the cockroach to kind of its lair, inject the cockroach, which is still alive, with some eggs, which then turn into little larval forms of the wasp, which will gradually eat through the inner organs of the cockroach over a couple, three days, killing it. And then the larvae will hatch and they'll, they'll come out as wasps to repeat the cycle. It is gross. I see that, Lily. Now, I say that because the truth is most creatures in the wild die while being attacked and eaten by predators, you know? And um, if you have an active imagination like I do, you don't want to think of too much about that stuff, but just to put it in perspective, you know? So it's understandable that we're scared. We're big, we're scared monkeys. You know, as my friend um, Rick Mendias, a neurologist helped me write Buddhist Brain, um, pointed out uh, we were prey long before we were top of the food chain predators, human human beings and uh, our hominid and then primate ancestors before that. So it's normal to be scared, right? How do we practice with it? And so I wanna offer a, a few fundamental teachings, you know, from the Buddha. And certainly we can still be prey, as Elaine says, you know, if, if those are the conditions in, that we're in at some point. So uh, it's interesting, in, in the Pali Canon, the collection of teachings in the Pali language, P-A-L-I, there are parallel teachings that have survived in Chinese and Sanskrit. But probably the best known uh, source of our best guess as to what the Buddha taught and thought and practiced and lived uh, is the Pali Canon this collection of teachings that if you put them in a bookcase, would be, there are a lot of them. You go from here to there, a lot of them. In that, I'm not a super poly scholar, but pretty knowledgeable. 
uh, certainly of good translations in English. Uh, there's not that much about fear. There's a lot about aversion and hatred, uh, you know, resisting things. But what we in modern, certainly developed countries tend to be preoccupied with, you know, a certain, you know, apprehensiveness and uneasiness, anxiety, uh, worry. These subtler forms, certainly they're not that talked about. What is talked, but it, it's not that the Buddha didn't acknowledge them. It's just that they're not that talked about. So we, we, we find our own uh, practical wisdom uh, in the context of Buddhist psychology to the extent we find value in it. So for you, for you, I invite you to really consider what role does fear play in your life? To what extent does it affect your experiencing? And to what extent does it affect your functioning? These are the two great dimensions that are considered in clinical practice. You know, what's it like to be you? And um, how are you acting? How are you behaving? Including in your interactions with others and what you talk about. What role does fear play in your life? Just right there, mindfulness of fear. Fear on a spectrum from very subtle forms of uneasiness, apprehensiveness, to full-on terror and panic. On the one hand, are there some things you should be scared about that you're not? And when I say scared, I'm, I'm using it loosely for things that are actual threats or risks that you should foreground more. Um, sometimes, you know, marriages or relationships can gradually be sort of fraying at the seams. People are not doing things about it. Um, you know, tendencies in teenagers that you keep kind of kicking down the road, you keep thinking this is going to turn a corner, don't. Um, health issues that could be addressed early on as small problems when left alone become big ones. You know, are there things we should take more into account? And is there a way to deal with threats without being scared? Angelus Aryan had a line, I think, action binds anxiety, close to it. There's a place for taking action, making a plan, taking action. Um, helplessness is not good. There's an ultimate peacefulness about everything, but that's different from feeling scared and helpless. Uh, take the actions you can take, make sure you're taking them. And to realize that it's possible to deal with threats without feeling scared. Maybe there's a little bit of anxiety around the edges, enough to keep you alert and energized, but you're coping, you're dealing with them. So what I'm talking about is mindfulness of the role of fear in your life. Second, are there things that you should feel more threatened by? And if so, take action, which then creates the space for really looking at unnecessary fear. That's my third headline here. Mindfulness of the role of fear in your life, taking action where appropriate, doing what you can. Right? 
And third, um, appreciating where you're adding fear to conditions. In other words, I remember walking through airports back during the early days of the so-called war on terror, terrorism, at threat level orange. And there was, you know, threat level orange is the last stop before red for my flight on that airplane that day. It was more like threat, threat, threat level chartreuse, right? Uh, very, very uh, green with a little drop of yellow. And I just think about the ways in which we get worked up with fears that are um, way unnecessary, way added, you know, to, to um, coping. People sometimes are afraid of not being afraid that if they're um, if they don't, if they're not endlessly anxious, and you know, then that's when they'll lower their guard and get whacked. Well, you can still be vigilant. You can still be tough as nails. You can still be like, whoa, a farce to be reckoned with. You can still uh, seek help as best you can. You know, we can do all those things without being nervous all the time. I'm going to make sure there's time for questions here because this is a huge topic and there are a lot of individual situations that can illustrate these points better. But I just want to name one, mindfulness of the role of fear in your life, two, where it would be helpful to, to deal with threats and risks to the extent you can, and then where th fear is added and you can cope well without it, you know, and even think about ways in which you get preoccupied. You, you fall into what Judson Brewer has called the habit of anxiety. It's a habit. It's like your mind keeps worrying, thinking that it will get some reward. It'll figure it out, but it's just looping. It's just running route laps around the worry track, digging the ruts deeper, you know, as you go round and round. Uh, that's not good. So what to do? That moves into my fourth headline here. Okay. There are very useful cognitive practices where literally you can make a list and you could, you know, put a statement there uh, that you know you're worried about, and then list rational, positive, productive, realistic alternatives. All right. Um, and for me, there's a fundamental teaching of the Buddha that uh, is really useful here. Because at this point, mo many minds are saying, well, yeah, what about? Well, yeah, what about illness, aging, death? What about that? What about the fact that the healthcare system uh, is you know, really limited and problematic? What about the fact that uh, I don't have, you know, a, I've lost loved ones and I'm living alone and I don't have many resources. Yeah, yeah. What about that? What about that? Um, you know, you might belong to a group of people that is routinely mistreated. Anti-Semitism, for example, is on the horrible rise. Um, and let alone many, 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 many other groups of people that are being attacked right now in the world. So understandably, what about that? What about, understandably? And for me, and you decide for yourself how you wanna be about this. For me, the, one of the central teachings of the Buddha and many other wise beings throughout history is the inherent limits to safety. The bottom can fall out, you know? I get checked for skin cancer four times a year because I've had two melanomas and I never know, my heart pounds a little, I never know going in. The bottom can fall out. Uh, you know, the next phone call you get from your doctor could be bad news, you don't know. 
a phone call could be someone you love has just died suddenly or something's happened. You know, people you thought were reliable can suddenly turn out to be traitors to you. Never saw that coming, but it did. Whack. Guess what? That's, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be snarky here. That's the world in which we live with its wonders, its gifts, the extraordinariness of a human life. You know, nearly 14 billion years after the, the Big Bang, um, <sighs> shit happens. Things fall apart. The center doesn't hold. All bleeding stops eventually, one way or another, as a surgeon client of mine once told me. Um, right? How do we, we have to live with that? And so there's a limit to safety. There's a limit to what we can do and existentially. You know, and I, I live in the knowing in any sense that the movie could stop at any point. The lights could go out for me. Oh, oh. And of course the body ah, doesn't like that. And it's okay that that's also true. Of course the little monkey, little monkey wants to stick around, right? And it's sad and upset and auto should have been treated better. Absolutely. And still, you know, there's a lot of inadequacy in the world. There's a lot of betrayal, a lot of cruelty. Humans are astonishingly cruel to each other sometimes. Uh, and I feel sometimes that we kind of try to, we sort of, our minds try to scratch and claw at the limits there of, of the reality we're in, not productively, not resourcefully, productively, you know, extracting the highest level of care you possibly realistically can from a messed up medical system, healthcare system, that's still astonishingly better than what was available to people a hundred years ago. Um, you know, and I'm not talking about not being resourceful. I'm just saying there's a certain way I think we, there's a place for accepting the limitations of human existence, limitations of safety, limitations of predictability, of control, of influence. Um, you know, I, I, I put my rice and vegetables in the microwave and I push the button and it heats up. It's like, wow, great. It's so predictable until the microwave breaks. But usually it's really predictable. Most of life is just not like that. They're just inherent limits to controllability and predictability. So how do we live in peace uh, while knowing at any moment the bottom can fall out? Because we have no choice. At some moment, the bottom will fall out. The only question is, how do you want to live meanwhile? Do you want to live confidently? Do you want to live bravely, with courage, uh, doing the best you can, walking each other home along the way? That's our opportunity in a life in which eventually the bottom will fall out. But the fact that the bottom eventually going to fall out doesn't need to put us in a state of fear. It can put us in a state of celebration and love and caregiving for all others who are with us. Uh, walking home on ground that will disappear beneath our feet for each of us one day or over the course of many days. Um, that's our opportunity, right? And to me, that's a fundamental kind of perspective that's really useful. And along the way, to finish here, um, we really, really need to succor the body, S-U-C-C-O-R, succor, to help the body because the body is scared. The body doesn't want to go. The body doesn't want to fall apart. Bodies that were real chill about falling apart back in Jurassic Park, they did not have children who lived. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so there are a couple of practices I want to recommend to you and then I'll finish. One is the practice of the recognizing in the present that your body's basically okay. It's breathing, its organs are functioning, awareness is continuing, and marinate in the reassurance of that. That's a deeply useful and available practice. Most seconds of most people's 
lives. Notice you're all right right now, really, and marinate in the feeling of all rightness. That's a deep, important practice that can calm the body and help it be um, more at peace in the inherent uncertainties of things. Second, open your heart. Love. Love is one of the most powerful medicines for anxiety. It, in practical terms, connects us with others. It builds pathways of connection and support from others that can help to reduce actual threats and bring in resources that we can draw upon. Uh, and also um, the flow of lovingness in and out is um, calming. You know, oxytocin receptors on the amygdala are inhibitory. So experiences of lovingness calm the threat reactive, you know, cascade. Um, and I think there's something ultimately kind of mysterious as we open to a sort of pulse of love flowing through us in the ongoing generativity of, of reality as it continually opens into the next moment. That itself can really and bo- and and hearten you and encourage you. Uh, love fundamental for fear for anxiety. And then um, something that I think is in too short a supply for many of us is a certain sense of muscularity on your own behalf. There's no replacement for moxie, for a certain feisty, scruffy, determined. You know. You're trying to help it be good. You're on your own side. You know, you're strong for yourself. There, you know, cultivation of that. And and I know it's harder if we're depressed or um, in pain or worn out. But even in the center of that worn outness can be uh, an unbreakable will on your own behalf. And the cultivation of that, knowing what that feels like, developing it, honoring it, appreciating it as a virtue. You know, um, we don't tend to think about moxie or a kind of a muscular determination on our own behalf uh, as an important um, thing to cultivate. It, it's not on any of the Buddhist lists, although the Buddha demonstrated it in his own life by his own example. So those would be three to suggest the recognition in your practice and the reassurance that you're basically all right right now when you are helping the body live in groundlessness. Um, um, with a whole heart, second, love, and third, um, moxie, muscularity. Okay. So what do you think about all that? Yes, but what about, what are the what abouts? Really happy to speak to that. And kind of quickly, I'm just going to name that. Um, yes, it is easy it is easier for me as a privileged white guy, middle class, upper middle class at this point, economically and you know, resourced, et cetera, American, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it is easier for me than it is for many people to talk about um, you know, stepping out of the hypnotic clutches of fear. Yep, it is easier for me. Okay. And still, what's true for you? And I would argue that, um, and it's really been true for me in the harder times of my life, it was more important to implement these teachings about fear and courage that I'm sharing with you tonight. Um, that was true for me. And I, I looked at the examples of so many people, including people who have been teachers for me, through their example, throughout history, their words. Um, just the more that the world is falling apart, for you, the more that it's kicking you in the teeth, the more important it is to recognize real threats while also not being stressed and preoccupied and burdened by unnecessary anxiety. Aha, okay, so let's see, great. Um, so I'm gonna respond to questions now coming in the, the chat. So. Privately to me, someone writes, what about the difference between a trauma response and an unnecessary fear? It's a great question. Each of us has to decide what's productive, necess- productive levels of fear and what's not. And what I mean by that is that 
certain things happen. And as the Buddha pointed out, uh, there can be an unpleasant experience. So in the moment something can happen, boom, unbidden is panic or terror or shock. You're scared, right? Uh, and it may not just be something short. It could be you're in a situation in which you're living with someone who could be abusive. Like you never know, could happen, right? Understandable, the, the body is going to have that kind of reaction to it. That That is unbidden. Then the question becomes, how do we practice with that, right? Um, how do we practice with that? But itself, um, it's necessary in that you can't prevent it. It's like, is, is blinking necessary? You know, if the hands move toward the, the eyes, yeah, of course you blink. I'm more talking about chronic. Thank you for clarifying this for me, by the way. I'm really talking about chronic anxiety, not just like what floods you in the moment, but what you live with on a regular basis, how we, how, we, how we live in the world on a regular basis. That's more what I'm talking about here. And then in that context, um, I think there's certain uh, times when uh, anxiety is absolutely called for. Uh, you're, you have a loved one and you're not at all clear they're getting good medical care. I've been there, I've been there. And of course you're worried about that. Or maybe you've gotten a project pulled together that's your baby, you really care about it. And suddenly other people are you know, getting in the way of it actually flourishing and t taking it down a road that will destroy it. Whoa, of course you're gonna be worried about that. Or you know, there's, there's a place for that. I've been, I've had times in wilderness or other situations, nearly drowned, other t things where, yeah, um, I had no problem <laughs> with the amount of fear I was having at the time. The question then becomes though, what's productive? What's productive chronically for you? What adds value? What's informative? You know, fear should add value. Otherwise, if it's, if it's not adding value, it's, it's unnecessary suffering and it's costly because it degrades performance. It makes you less able to cope with threats, Unne unnecessary chronic anxiety. So that's that's kind of the key distinction here. All right, any other what about? Yes, buts, I love it. Um, do, 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 yep, very good. Nancy, 21 minutes past the hour, very important point, temperament. So I'm mildly anxious in my temperament. I know other people are more anxious in their temperament, and then lived experience, trauma, uh, targeted for, you know, in systemic ways, living in threats. My wife and I are just starting, are watching um, Lessons in Chemistry. Basically, it's about, uh, you know, terrible forms of sexism in the 1950s and early 1960s and other things. Uh, yeah, it's understandable that there's a kind of a chronic background trickle of anxiety. And then the question becomes, what do we do about it? Um, technically in psychology, there's what's called signal anxiety, and then there's other anxiety. Signal anxiety functions to signal that there's a threat or there could be, right? It's, it's signal, it's informative. But when anxiety is merely noise, there's no information value in it, right? So chronic temperamental anxiety, just a low grain background trickle, if not stream, um, it, it, it doesn't add value. It's not informative because it's chronic, right? Um, and you can be chronically alert and vigilant and thoughtful and prudent and cautious. I have a little saying, think boldly, act cautiously um, without feeling anxious along the way. It's, that's kind of the real question here. Where does anxiety add value? I think there are places for anger and remorse and certainly sorrow and anxiety where they add value. And, and obviously there's, there's a certain amount of that that's just happening there. It's, it's triggered, it's arising, it's present. Um, we're not a choice about it. But to the extent we're at choice about how much fear we live in and with and, and express to others, um, that's a real question. Is that fear, does it add value? And so to cope with chronic temperamental anxiety, the practices I named are really useful. Also what you can do is you can start to um, 
correct for it, right? Because you know that you're chronically anxious or because you know you have a chronic health problem that understandably is sending alarm signals bubbling up into your nervous system or through the you know, rising in consciousness as this background sense of unease, you know, that your body is sending. When that's chronic, you can correct for it. You can go, you know, okay, that's a kind of preamp that's gonna turn up the signal of threat that I can take into account and remind myself not to be so threatened by. That's a, that we can actually do that. And then over time, dial down the um, anxious uh, background noise in the body through practices like uh, the ones I've named, as well as you know biofeedback devices like inner balance or other things like that. Um, you know, uh, people I think are exploring uh, psychedelic assisted therapies in new kind of ways, plant medicines, which have been appreciated throughout the world, of course, uh, long before they got studied by modern, uh, you know, neuropsychologists and, and therapists. Um, so you could do things to help your body become less and less anxious. For myself, I've gotten very interested in a kind of granularity of mindfulness of anxiety and seeing what it's like you can play with this, to walk down a hallway without one molecule of anxiety. How many seconds in a row can you sustain walking down the street or in a market or while talking with someone without any sense of anxiety, right? And then it becomes quite interesting. You start to realize, wow, so much of my anxiety is added. It's constructed. It's not inherent in the situation. I'm actually safe in the present. Huh. Wow. It's like auto, you know, auto anxiety. Wow. <laughs> you know, and then it gets really interesting and you like increasingly try to live free of it in a more and more granular moment by moment kind of way. Uh, it helps to really calm the body. It's the body that gets anxious and then it you know it drives the mind and then of course sometimes our thoughts make our bodies anxious but um calming the body calming the body okay let's see any other key questions coming in excellent lovely i love the comments i always read everybody's comments eventually rachel i don't think i'm going to be able to get to you i'm so sorry uh cuz i do want to end on time here uh tonight um Next week, we'll have a wonderful guest teacher, I think and hope, Warren J. Sofer, whose book, You Just uh, Say What You Mean, one of the best books around for conversations that are challenging through by using nonviolent communication. And he's going to talk next week about how to talk about stuff in the world with people. Uh, he's really a specialist about that. And I want to have him as a guest teacher because it's so timely. How do we talk with others these days about these, wow, super hot button issues? You know, whoa, just even naming a particular part of the whole can set off fireworks. Or if you leave out any part of the whole, understandably, sets off fireworks. So, Or come back next week. Okay, good. So let's see here. That's great. Open your heart. Hmm. So, Anne. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so somebody asked me, what does it mean to open your heart? Right. And, uh, I'm really glad you, you stopped me there because like, you know, I have catchphrases I use and what do they actually mean? It's great. I love it. So I mean, it most fundamentally is a slightly poetic and I did not coin the phrase, uh, way of moving into something embodied. Like right now you might like have us put your hand on your heart. You might even, if it's meaningful to you, move your hand over the area of your heart in a clockwise form, which people who know more about this than I do might talk about opening a chakra or energy field, whatever is true about that in that area, you know, like it's opening, you could feel that. And, um, 
You know, I, my friend and teacher, Gil Fronstall, I asked him once what he did in his own practice these days. This was some years ago. He smiled, paused, smiled, and said, I stopped for suffering. That's heart opening. Suffering in others, suffering in ourselves, stop for suffering. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we let others land. That's what I mean by opening the heart. We let them land. We slow it down enough to, we give them, you know, that extra few seconds of attention that it takes for some to feel somebody, not just see somebody. Our emotional empathic systems need a few more seconds to kind of catch up. So we, oh, oh, we let them land. Doesn't mean we agree with them. Doesn't mean we approve, although we might. But we're opening, opening our heart. That's what I mean by that, opening our heart. And I find it's interesting that being open-hearted seems more accessible than being warm-hearted. Being warm-hearted seems more accessible than being loving. Uh, so open-hearted. You know, I can I can feel open hearted. There's a curiosity and open heartedness. Who are you? Right? When we meet someone or see someone, who are you? Like there's that initial genuine openness, inquiry. Maybe we need to close our hearts, you know. In extreme conditions, perhaps. Because it, that person's attacking us, and our heart becomes a portal through which, kind of like the Trojan horse through the gates of Troy, um, you know they're attacking us through that openness. Okay, maybe we need to close our heart. Doesn't mean we have to hate them or be cruel. Okay, but often we can meet people with an open heart, and you know what it's like when you meet people with an open heart. Huh? That's what I mean by that. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay. So let's just pause here for a few breaths as we finish. Acknowledging fear, using fear, not being used by fear. And recognizing increasingly fear that is helpful to you and fear that is a hindrance, a burden, a suffering that has no value for you and practicing with that kind of fear on a path to becoming increasingly free of it with more and more room for a, a courageous, resourceful heart. <laughs> 